Okay, so now I started recording. So again, uh, thanks everybody for joining us for the in the Learning Lab 11 provided by the Cruise Data Science Initiative. Uh, just to record, those are free webinars open to everybody. And if you have anyone that wants to attend, you can always send the link for people to register. And they happen after two weeks. So for today, you're gonna to be talking and how to use hybrid machine learning models to improve your predictions. Uh, it's gonna be presented by me, Daniel Tred and Dave Emery. So just for a small introduction, uh, my name is Marcelo Guarido and I'm a data scientist who is a PhD in geophysics and head of the data uh, science initiative. So I'd like uh, Daniel, if you could present yourself. Hi. My name is uh, Daniel Trad. I'm a uh, professor in the Department of uh, Geoscience, and uh, um, I am doing my best to help Marcelo in his uh, data science initiative. Okay, Dave. And hello, I'm David Emery. I'm uh, uh, been helping Marcelo now for the last year and a half, and it's soon to be entering as a graduate student under Daniel Tran in machine learning. Um, I've got 34 years of experience in industry working with geoscience and seismic. Okay, thank you. So uh, this presentation is gonna be available later today for everybody to download. And here we have the links to our LinkedIn's webpage. So you can follow us on LinkedIn and, and keep in tune for the new labs and when they're going to release and what they're going to be about. So my introduction is to talk about the CRUISE Data Science Initiative. Uh, it's a subgroup inside the CRUISE. We're going to be working with data science projects related to machine learning and data analysis, uh, focused on geoscience projects, but you are open to other type of projects as well. And they're going to be doing academic and industry projects. As well, we have a programming training that could be something a little simpler, like how to do programming R, Python, and or MATLAB as training more complex, like uh, how to create applications and how to do applications in machine learning to your projects. And also we provide these uh, learning labs that are weekly, uh, bi-weekly webinars and if you have interest, you can always keep joining or you can go to the Cruise Data Science uh, website or to the Cruise website and go to the research links and the Data Science um, tab. We have the information from all the previous labs that we started last year. So for today, what you're going to be talking, you're going to be talking about these hybrid models. And this is going to be based on a paper that uh, we read before and they're gonna to try to replicate, not totally, just how to create the hybrid models. Uh, so they're gonna be doing a paper overview. Second, they're gonna be talking how to create hybrid models using the MLX stand, that's a library in Python. And in the coding part, we're gonna be showing how to do the to stack regression models, that uh, it's a way to combine the models and create hybrid models. And for the classification, you're gonna show me to do both for regression and classification and how to create an ensemble voting system for trained classifiers. So for the paper that we are following is this paper for, from 2020 from Khan et al. Uh, the machine learning based approach to predict the energy consumption of renewable and non-renewable power sources. Uh, we talked about this paper two weeks ago. I'm just gonna uh, refresh what we talked about. So um, the, the goal of this paper is that they're gonna be using an island in the south area of South Korea, Jeju, to be used as a test. So they wanna uh, calculate what is the demand of energy in this island and because in the future, by 2030, the South Korea wants to replace all the source of energy for this island from non-renewable to renewable energy. And what they are doing, they are doing a forecasting model to see how it's gonna be the, the use of energy in this time. 
uh, by the electrical system that they have there. They have the the, the control from about of everything from the JEC, and they have two different types of uh, sources of energy: the non-renewable energy that's based on uh, fossil fuels, and the renewable energy that uh, can come from photovoltaic, that's uh, the solar uh, energy, wind power, and the BTM is just a photovoltaic, but uh, without contract. So it's every house that has any solar panel. And that's what they're gonna be using. They're gonna be using uh, the production of uh, the energy from this source to calculate what's gonna be in the future. So what they are doing, uh, this is the, the plot of uh, what is the total of energy needed in the last uh, eight years from 2012 to 2020 from both uh, fueled fossil, uh, or fossil fuel and renewable energy. And in both scenarios, uh, the demand for electricity is increasing. So they're going to be doing a forecasting combining these both uh both of these sources and try to predict the future and they are do doing that by creating a hybrid model so they have uh the data for the training and in their work they are using three different uh classifiers and sorry not classifiers they are using three different regressors the cat boost that's a simple library for Sorry, that's a library for gradient boosting. They're using also the support vector uh, regressor and uh, multi-layer perception that uh, just the fully connected neural networks where they do the forecasting for, from each one of these models and then they combine in a way the forecasting from these three models to create a hybrid forecasting model. And they do that actually by doing another reg regression over the forecasting. And what they do in their paper, they compare with other models, models that are not hybrid. So this is the forecasting for a test data set for June of 2019. And the actual is in blue and the predicted is in black. And they are getting quite nice predictions uh it's just weird that by the end of the month always the prediction is gonna be is being a little over predicted so they are always getting higher values than what they should be getting actually in most of the scenarios but in a overall i believe that it's working quite nice and when comparing to different models like uh, regression models like the lasso ridge gradient boosting the machine learning, the neural network regressor, support vector regressor, the XG boosting, and with the proposal that's the hybrid in both of their metrics, the mean absolute error and the square root of the mean squared error, uh, you're getting bet better metrics because lower this metric, better the model is behaving. So the proposed model seems to be working better than the other models. And for everybody that wants, this is the paper. You can click always in the DOI here, and it's gonna open the web page where you can do actually download the the paper. So, just continuing, let's talk about the hybrid models and how to create hybrid models. Today, you're gonna be seeing in the coding part how to do that in Python. We're gonna be using models from the Scikit-Learn library and the ML extend to create the hybrid models. Uh, if you go to the ML extend documentation, they have a few plots there and explanations in how to create those hybrid models. One is for the regression that they call the stacking regressor. Uh, and it works like we have different uh, machine learning models here, regression model. One could be a linear regression, gradient boosting, neural network, or even different linear regressions or different uh, gradient boosting with different hyperparameters. Uh, 
for each one of those models, you're going to calculate the predictions, the regression. And what they do, they use a meta regressor that's another regressor uh, model that is trained over the predictions to get a final prediction. So that's how they are stacking the models. For classification, there are two ways to do. One is the voting system. Uh, when you have also the classification models, their predictions, and we do the voting, and the voting can be done uh, in two different ways that we're gonna be showing in the coding part. Uh, the first one is just a voting like election, like just counting the, the class that was uh, appeared more times in here. That's called the hard voting. Or you can have the soft voting. The soft voting is when we the predictions that they are using for the voting are the probabilities. So they calculate the, the mean probability for each one of the classes and get the one that has the highest probability. And the last one for the classification, it's also very similar to the meta regressor where they do a meta classifier where instead of a voting, they actually train another uh, classification model over the predictions of the input models for the hybrid. So these models are trained in, in your training data set and the meta classifier is trained over the predictions to get the final prediction. And today, what you're gonna be checking, both for regression classification, are these two methodologies. For the regression, you're gonna be seeing how to use the meta regressor. And for the classification, you're gonna be seeing the voting system. Uh, if you have any questions so far, you can always send a, a message and you can answer as we are working here. So now let's code. So we're gonna be using a Jupyter notebook to show what you're doing. So there are two ways that I'd like to show how to run the Jupyter Notebook. You can run by the Jupyter Notebook itself uh, that opens your web browser. So this is the code that uh, is gonna be available soon in the Cruise website. Um, in the other way that I actually prefer how to show is using the VS code, the Visual Studio code that is like that. So we just open, this is the same Jupyter, this is the same uh, notebook in Python. It's just open in a different uh, application. Instead of open in a browser, you just open in the VS Code. I like to work here because I can have everything centralized in just one type of uh, application. So usually I also run Latex here. When I'm creating HTML apps, I also use the VS Code. So I like to use more this one. And to run the codes and everything's exactly the same. You're gonna have your markdown cells where you're gonna work with your markdown information to create your reports. And you have your coding cells like those ones. So, okay, so for the coding today, what you're gonna be using is gonna be learning how to create a hybrid machine learning models using the library ML Extend. If you click here, we're gonna open the home page of the MLX10 and you have the user guide with different examples for different uh, applications they have here. They don't have only the, the stacking uh, or the ensemble voting, but they have different actually models that you can create, create here. Even for the regression, you can have linear regression. Uh, for classifier, you have classification models that they have by themselves, that's a little bit different from the scikit-learn, as well, the stacking and the ensemble vote classifier. And for regressor, they have also the stacking regressor, and the stacking regressor is a, a cross-validation. Um, all the models that you're gonna be using are coming from the scikit-learn package. So if you click here, this is the scikit-learn. So it has a, a very large number of different models and pre-processing of the data that you wanna do. So it's a very complete package that I really like to use. So I really recommend 
doing machine learning, start learning scikit-learn. That's quite important. And for the data set that you're going to be using here in both scenarios, uh, we don't have the same data set as the paper. So we're going to be using the data set that uh, are provided by the scikit-learn itself. So if you click here, the scikit-learn.datasets, it's a model inside the scikit-learn package uh, where you can download and use different data sets that they have for classification, for clustering, for regression. So today, what you're going to be using is the Fetch California Housing, that's the price of housing in California for the regression. And for the classification, you're going to use the breast cancer prediction. If you want to, we are trying to predict if it's malignant or benign, the cancer. So let's start with the regression. So we're going to be using the data set Fetch California Housing. If we click here, we go to the Circuit Learn web page and how to use it. So we have some input parameters where we're going to download the data. If you want it to be split in an X, Y, or just one file, means the X features and the Y the target. But in, in our case, I prefer to get them uh, in just one file. And also we're going to be using as data frames. Uh, oops, sorry. So in this data set, they have eight features and one target. So I'm just going to enter here the user guide of this data set. And that is the explanation of the whole data set. So there are more than 20,000 rows, uh, eight numeric attributes for us predict or the features. And what you wanted to predict are the price of the house. Uh, actually, it's a, a block group. We want to predict the price of a block group. So you're going to see numbers that are not a price of a house, but uh, the block group. But that's OK. You just want to see how to create the hybrid models. And that's how you're going to start in the load, uh, download the data and checking the data. First here, we're just going to import the pandas, NumPy, the matplotlib, and the data set. And I'm just using this morning to ignore all the warning messages that appear in the code. So if you run here, we can run just by pressing this arrow or shift enter. That's the, the way that I like to run. I press shift enter. So now I'm loading. Oops, let me just going to refresh here. Everything. And let me just run again. So now I load those libraries, those packages, and the function that's going to be downloading the data set. So here I'm calling the function. And I wanted to download the data set as just one data. I don't want to separate in different uh, files what is the feature and what is the target. And I want to download as data frame. But something that you're going to see that uh, when you download the data set, this is not initially a data frame. This is a dictionary. So I'm just going to run this. And this call here that I'm calling call because of the, of the California, it's a, actually a dictionary. And if you extract the keys of the dictionary, we see that uh, we have the data in one of the elements, the target in another, if it is data frame or not, the data and the target, what are the target names? That is the name of the, this column for the target and the feature names and a description. So each one of those, if we call, we're going to have a different information. And for this data, uh, if we extract only the data from this uh, dictionary, this is actually a data frame. Also, I'm printing here what is the description of the data set. So call dot description. And this is the description that is the same as the website. Uh, how many rows you have, uh, the number of attributes, what they are, each one. There are no missing values, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, what is the target? That uh, is the median uh, house value for California districts. So that's the, the target 
and that's what you're going to be trying to predict. And even the reference for the original use for this data set. If you call other uh, elements of this dictionary, you're going to get different stuff. First, the features that are going to be the column names of the features and the target. What is the name of the target? So if you call this and print those, so those are lists now. Those are the, they are going to be the name of the columns. And this is the name of the column for the target. And now for this cell, I'm now getting the data frame from the data and including one new uh, column, that's the target. So when I do that, that's the data frame. So we are printing the head, the five first rows of this data frame. And we have all those features that we're gonna be using from media income to the longitude. And this is our target. That's what you wanna to try to predict using regression. So for the regression models that you're gonna be stacking by the end, you're gonna be using three different models, all from scikit-learn package. The linear regression, the gradient boosting, and the neural networks. If you click in each one of those, it's gonna open uh, the documentation. This is the documentation for the, uh, for the linear regression. This is for the gradient boosting regressor because you have the gradient boosting classifier and also for the neural networks that they call MLP, that uh, it's a multi-layer perceptron regressor. So let me start and close a little bit of those tabs. And okay. And also for the metrics that you wanted to evaluate if the model is doing well, we're gonna be using the exp explained variance score and the mean score error. So, those are also the documentation for the, explan the explained variance score. If you want to understand better how it works, you just go to the user guide. So they have even the formula that they're using. So you're just seeing uh, what is the variance of our data set divided by the variance, the variance over the medium divided by the variance, basically. And the mean squared error is just a simple L2 norm, basically, of our data set, of our predictions. So the true value minus the prediction. Uh, here, we are loading all of the those functions, all the models, linear regression, gradient boosting, the neural network. We are also going to be loading the strain test split, because they're going to split this data set that you had before from into train and test. So we're gonna be training our model in a training data set that's gonna be 80% of this data and evaluating the 20% of the data that uh, is not gonna be touched by the model during the training. And also loading the metrics. So we just run here. Now we loaded all those functions. Here we are doing the train test split of the data. So we're gonna create two data sets the train, the test. And I selected here the random state equals zero because uh, they do a random split, but this is a meta random uh, because they have uh, some random states there that uh, if you set the random state, you're gonna get always the same random split. <laughs> So here, so everybody that run these is gonna get, get exactly the same results that I'm getting today. And here now is the shape, the size of uh, the data sets that we have for the training and for the test. We have nine columns, eight for the features and one for the target. So now we can start working with our linear regression. So that's how we train a model in using scikit-learn. We just call the function in here, that uh, we loaded on the top here. Uh, we can include some parameters, but uh, when I use empty parentheses inside here, it means that I'm using all the default parameters. I'm not gonna be changing anything. And then I'm using this dot fit, where I'm gonna be fitting the training data. 
So first you have to include the features. That's gonna be my data frame, but only the columns of the features and the target, that's my data frame and only the column for the target. After the model is trained, we calculated the prediction and they're gonna be calculated the prediction of the test data set only for the feature columns. And you wanna compare if the predictions that you get here are similar to the true values of, or of the test and the column target. So if you run this, we train it the model, it's quite fast. It's not a large data set. And here we're gonna be printing um, the scores that we got. And those are the scores. For the explained variance score, uh, it's a score that goes from zero to one, where one is a perfect model and zero is the worst model possible. And the mean squared error is gonna be a number that you want it to be close to zero. So we got the explained variance score of 59 for the linear regression and this value for this, the mean squared error. So I have to compare to the other models, see if it's a good number. So what am I gonna be doing initially? I'm gonna be plotting in here, uh, just a, a cross plot that uh, basically is measuring the correlation between true values and the predictions where you have the x-axis, the predictions, and the y, the, the true values. If you have a perfect, perfect model, we expect that all these blue dots would be over this perfect line here. Uh, this is not happening because we, the model is not perfect. And we actually see it's not even linear if you do this cross plot. That is this moon-shaped um, view. And we see also here in the five, there's a straight line, here the horizontal line. Uh, it's because the data set, the true values, they, are, uh, they have a limit for five. So what do you see from these predictions that for lower values of the, the price of the house, it's uh, underestimating the true price. And when the prices are higher, we are uh, overestimating basically. Now for the gradient boosting, it's the same way that you have to train, we call the gradient boosting. Uh, if you enter in the documentation, there are a bunch of uh, hyperparameters that you can change, but basically we're gonna be using all the uh, default parameters. I'm just setting the Rundle state again to the Rundle be the same for everybody. So we're gonna be training in the same training data set, calculating the predictions and measuring the scores in here. So when you run the scores, now the model is trained, we got a better score, the explained variance score now 0.78 and the mean squared error decreased for 0.89. So this model should to be better. That means that uh, the correlation between features and our target is not linear because the gradient boosting has non-linear properties as linear regression is a linear model. When you do the same uh, cross plot, um, comparing the true and the prediction values, it's better than the linear regression. It's a little closer to be over this line, but we still see a little bit of this moon shaped in here. And we still have the tennis of this not to be exactly the same as the line. If you would do a linear regression in this data set in here, in this plot, would be have a higher inclination than the perfect one. So for the last one, you're gonna be trying the neural networks. For this one, I changed a little bit of the hyperparameters. Uh, I changed the hidden layers that you're gonna be using uh, we have to input here a tuple and the number of elements in this tuple is gonna be the number of layers and the number inside each element is the number of neurons that you're using for the neural network. So what you are doing here, we have a neural network with five hidden layers and each and hidden layer with 30 uh, neurons. I just selected a random number like a 30 
was just uh, tried this one. I didn't try for any specific uh, reason. I just tried and just tried this number of layers. For the activation function inside the neurons, the default is to use ReLU, but for some reason, when I'm using the neural networks from the scikit-learn, the logistic always works better. All the projects that I did, it worked better using the logistic activation function. And the random state equals zero. So you can have the same starters, the same random starters, and everybody's gonna have the same results. So I'm gonna be doing the same, calculating the predictions, calculating the metrics, and plotting the, the cross plot between true and the predictions. So those are the results we get for the neural networks. Uh, if you just check initially the metrics, they got a little worse than the gradient boosting, but better than the linear regression. The neural network has non-linear features as well, but uh, it didn't work as well as a gradient boosting. And again, when we plot here, the cross correlation between them, Yes, uh, Brian, I tried the ReLU and actually the logistic work, worked better. If we just replace it here for ReLU and run again. You, yeah, sorry, you did mention that. <clears throat> yeah. So we got worse results in here. Just by changing to logistic now. Back. So we could improve our matrix and our plot. So a few weird things happening in here. Apparently it's not predicting any price that's lower than one in this, uh, in, and we also can see always the, this cap in here. So it creates a, a weird model, but uh, not as bad apparently as the linear regression for the metric. Now you're gonna be using the hybrid model. So using the ML extend package, uh, the regression version that you're gonna be using for this is the stacking regressor. So if you click here, you're gonna open the documentation so you can see from where I extract that uh, figure in the PowerPoint. Uh, what you're gonna be working here again is to get our regressors, the ones that I used to do single predictions before. And then we have to use another um, regressor to be trained over these uh, those predictions for singular predictions for each one of those models to get a final prediction. So here we can find even some examples and how to run it. Uh, but let's go to our coding. I see that Brian is asking if it's possible to have too many layers and are overfitting. Maybe we can try to reduce the number of the layers and see how our metric is gonna change. So I'm gonna use three layers now. So not improved a little bit. It was 63 before, if I'm not wrong. I forgot, forgot how, many, how much it was before, let me see. Yeah, so apparently if you remove a uh, number of layers and actually Brian say fewer is node. So let's try 10. Okay, now we couldn't get a good prediction for this one. So apparently we need more uh, nodes. So if you go back to, if you try 20 and 20, and 20, how it goes now. Now it's worse than using 30, but uh, what happened if you just using one hidden layer with 100, with 20 nodes? I don't know. Actually, we got a not bad model and solving the problem of those capping in this one, in the ones, not solving, but minimizing the problem. So maybe just one layer would be enough, like uh, more nodes. What's gonna happen with more nodes? So it's not changing too much. 
but that worked in the nice with just one node and fewer uh, with just uh, one layer and fewer nodes. Try try ReLU with that. Okay. See, that's how you run machine learning. You keep doing a trial and error. So we don't have this capping problem anymore, but now we have a similar problem as the linear regression to have this moon shape, but uh, it's still a little better than the linear regression. So what, what's the next suggestion? More nodes or less nodes, right? <laughs> I think more nodes with ReLU will do a good job. Okay. Actually, got a little. Oh no, it got worse. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's Hard weird. <laughs> it's weird. So maybe you can try yeah. two layers with twenty. I know that you cannot have too many nodes. Fifty-four. Ah, interesting. Okay. So we keep doing that. So I'm gonna go back to what I had before. But I'm gonna use three layers now, of thirty. Because. This was a good metric, apparently. Oh yeah, and we had this problem. Let's try the relu. Is it possible to change the um, function in each layer? So not just have logistic for each layer? No, in this case, it's just one for all of them. Okay. So let's keep this one, a logistic with three layers, each one with 30 nodes. So, and now we're gonna show how to do the hybrid model. So we're gonna be using this stacking regressor. Again. And that's how we're gonna be importing it. Uh, you use the ML extend dot regressor, the stacking regressor. And for the meta regressor, we have to train another regressor model. And by their examples, they use the supporting vector regressor with a kernel that's a RBF. This RBF, uh, that means that's not gonna be not a linear model. So I tried the same. So I'm gonna be importing the supporting vector regressor from the scikit-learn. And that's how you're gonna be using this model. So I'm gonna be saving the regressors in one list. So we have the model, linear regression, the model, gradient boosting regressor in the model, neural network regressors. Those are the models that you created here, those hyperparameters. And then I'm getting the support vector regressor with the RBF kernel in here. And when I use this, now this model, this stacking regressor, I have to say which, which one of the regressors that I want to stack those are going to be this list in here of our, our regressors. And what's going to be our meta regressor? So what's going to be the regression that's going to be training over the predictions? And I'm going to be using the support vector regressor. And how to train is very similar how to train for the scikit-learn library. We train over the train features and the train target. And it is a stacking model. That is no, I, but I'm just checking something. But apparently, uh, it's gonna be training all the models again inside here with the train and with the training. So it's gonna be trained again with the train data set, the regressors, and their output is gonna be trained using uh, support vector regressor. So here, I mean, just printing again, all the results that you had before, and they're gonna be comparing with the stacking version from the MLX 10. So I'm just gonna run. It's gonna take like a couple of seconds to run and we're gonna be plotting. Uh, there is a, those are the predictions that you got from all those models. And we see that the stack below here got a slightly better metrics compared to the gradient boosting and uh, way better than the others. So apparently by this data set, there is a, a limit uh, how to get a, a better prediction. And actually you also didn't do too much testing in the hyperparameters. 
but uh, we could make a, a small improvement in the matrix. And when you look also the correlation plots, now we don't have more the moon shaped in here. Actually, you are getting a more robust predictions if you look here. The matrix, only looking by the number of the matrix sometimes can be a little tricky because we still need to do some visualization to understand if it's working better or not. So this only is, it, it's a good measure of your model, but it's not uh, enough for you to make sure. So if you compare this with the gradient boosting, if you remember the gradient boosting, we still had a little bit of the moon shape, but now, So this RBF, uh, Brian, um, I don't know what, which one is using. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the most popular is the Gaussian, but the, we used to use a, a, what's called an Epinetchnikov, which, which decays directly to zero, which some people prefer. It, it probably has that in there if, if you look deeper. Yeah, if you go to the, probably, if you go to the SVR, SK1. So you might have all the options that you can include. Those mm. are the kernels that you can have, the linear, uh, oh, poly, okay. so RBF, the sigmoid, and the one pre-computed that you can create a kernel huh? outside and then include here. It looks like it assumes RBF is just one particular model. Maybe it's Gaussian or something, I don't know. Hmm. Yeah. I. Actually, I'm not that sure about the uh, RBF. We can look here as well. I think it's one of the kernels that you can create. Uh, it's a Gaussian process, yeah. So you're right. So it comes from the, Ga the Gaussian process, the kernel RBF. So it's the squared exponential kernel. So that's radio basis function. So that's stand for RBF. And yes, it's a, a Gaussian process. But uh, I'm not that sure how it works. I know that follows this equation. Sorry about that. So you can see a little improvement by using the stacking uh, models. Now, when going for the classification, you're going to be using Another data set from the Scikit-learn website is this breast cancer Wisconsin. So if you click here, this is the all information about our data set. We have uh, 30 features and two classes. So if you go to the user guide in here, we have uh, the 30 features. Those are all numeric. And those are all the features that are gonna be using. Those are measurements about the, the cancer. And we wanted to predict if they are malignant or benign. We're gonna have 212 rows that are classified as malignant and 357 as benign. So here, we're gonna just be downloading the data the same way we loaded the function to download the data. Again, it's gonna be a, a dictionary where we have the data, the target, if it's data frame or not, the name of the columns, the description, Oh, sorry, the name of the, the targets, that's, that's a list named uh, malignant and benign, the feature names and the fi a file name. Here, if you printed the description, we have uh, like the number of rows that uh, it's 569, 30 numeric uh, features, the information, the minimum and the maximum of each one of them. And the number, the, the class distribution. Looking by this number, we have like a, a unbalanced classification problem. We have more benign than malignant. So usually models are gonna try to predict benign more often than malignant, but it's not gonna be a big, a huge problem in this data set. So here I'm just being doing the same, save it in the target, the, what are the features and what are the targets and here just creating the data frame. So you're gonna have the 30 features in here and the last column is gonna be the target. So you're gonna have 31 columns in the end. And something that they never informed in the data set, 
we are going to have zeros and ones for the target and the, they didn't form what is zero and what is one, if zero is malignant or benign or vice versa. So what I did was just to plot a histogram of the target. And what I saw, I see that the zeros are 212, basically the number. So I concluded that zeros are malignant and one that's 357. I conclude that those are benign. So the class zero is malignant and the class one is benign. Uh, for this one, you're gonna be doing a similar work for the classification. You're gonna be using a, a linear model, in this case, a logistic regression, and also using gradient boosting and neural network. But in this case, you're gonna be using the classifier version. If you click here, you're gonna to go to the documentation and you're gonna be using the classifier version of them. And for the metrics, you're gonna be using the accuracy score. And also you're gonna be printing a confusion matrix. So the confusion matrix, it's a print like that, where you're gonna have a true label and the predicted label and how many were predicted with true and how many were predicted as wrong. So in this example here, we have for the Setosa that uh, all the predictions got corrected in the true values for the versicolor 10 were corrected predicted but uh, 10, nine, six of the versicolors were predicted as uh, Virginica. And all the nine Virginica were properly uh, predicted. So we're gonna be talking about the true positive, false positive, and all those terminology. So here, just uh, again, load the functions from the scikit-learn library. Again, doing the trust test and train split of the data set. So those are the new shapes. And now you're gonna be running the logistic regression. Uh, they're gonna be using mostly for the logistic regression, the default parameters. I'm just gonna select the rondo state zero for the initial guess of the weights. And as we have uh, imbalanced the problem, I'm just saying that uh, the class weights to be balanced. So what the model is gonna be trying to do is to calculate different weights for each one of the classes. So as we have less samples for the malignant, so it's gonna give you more importance to classify malignant uh, class. Here I'm gonna be training the model where I include the features as the X parameter and the target as the Y parameter. Here we're gonna be calculating the predictions of the test data set. And then you're gonna be calculating the accuracy score using the true values and the, the predicted values, sorry, the true values and the pred predicted values. And you're gonna be plotting the confusion matrix. So this function requires what is your model that you train it, uh, your input parameters or your input features, your target, and if you want it to be normalized or not. So when you run this, so this is the confusion matrix that were created. So I select that to be normalized. So this is the percentage that was uh, correctly uh, predicted. So 96% of the zero of the malignant was uh, correctly classified and 93% of the benign is co uh, correctly classified. And the accuracy in here is 0.94. So 94% of the data was correctly classified. Uh, now we're gonna do the same as the gradient boosting classifier. We're gonna use only the default parameters. So you can see for this model that you got a higher accuracy in the end. Uh, the difference that you got here is that you got a worse accuracy for the malignant class, but better accuracy for the benign class. So I'd like to ask you guys, which one of the models would you prefer better? If you have to select one of them, doesn't you have an idea? And why? You can unmute if you wanna answer this question. 
I'm going for the first one. Why? Because it's more important to not uh, get a false positive. I agree. So it's yeah, more you've important. got better, better, larger numbers in the yellow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what to say that uh, in this case of a medicine, it's quite important for you to classify the malignant, the malignant better uh, because uh, a false uh, negative in this case, it's worse because you're talking about a treatment of a cancer. Hmm. So it's better for you in this case to make a little more errors in the benign than in the malignant. Hmm. You don't want to misclassify the malignant. But ideally, you've got ones in the in the yellow and zeros in the purple, right? Yeah, that's what you want for these balls. You want to have ones in the diagonals here. That's a confusion matrix. So for the neural network, now we did the same uh, parameters that you had before, and we got uh, similar accuracy as the logistic regression, but we did way better in the benign than the mal malignant. So now when you're gonna use in the hybrid model, we're gonna be using this ensemble world classifier. So that works a little different than what you said before. Instead of a training uh, a classification model in here, you're just gonna be doing the voting system. You're gonna just vote in like an election. What's the class that appear more for the hard voting or for the soft voting? Uh, we're going to be averaging the probabilities for each class and then select the one with the higher probability then, with the higher averaged probability. So initially, let's, let's show how it works. So the same way, we're going to save the classifiers in a list. So those are the three models that you trained before the logistical regression for the classification, the gradient boosting for the classification, the neural network for the classification. And then we are gonna use this ensemble vote classifier function from the MLX10 library. The classifiers that you're gonna be using are the classifiers that you selected before. The voting system, you can select to be hard or soft. First, let's show how the hard works. We can give some weights. We can say which model is more important uh, initially, I gave the weight one for each one of the models. So one for the logistic regression, one for the gradient boost, and one for the neural network. But I can change these numbers in here to any any number that I want. And these fit-based estimators, I selected to false uh, because the models are already trained. So that means that I'm not going to be training again the model, those three models. I'm just going to be training the voting system. And again, I'm just going to be showing the accuracy score for the predictions and the confusion matrix. So when you run this with the hard voting, what you got here is a 96 uh, percent accuracy, and we see that you got uh, 96 percent correct in the malignant and 96 correct for the benign. If you compare to the gradient boosting and the logistic regression, for example, you can see that uh, the 96% in the malignant are coming from basically the logistic regression and a, best, a better prediction in the benign are basically coming from the gradient boosting and the neural network. If you just change here to soft instead of using the hard voting, but using the probabilities, that's what happened. We actually improved the classification of the malignant. We getting 98% of the malignant cancer correctly uh, classified. So in my opinion, we got even a better metric because we kept the same metric for the benign. If you go back to hard, you can see again. So we keep the same number of wrong here, but uh, so tell us, tell us the difference between soft and hard again. So hard is just uh, when you have the classification, uh, the classification models from the psychic learn, like we have one here, is the logistic regression, others the gradient boosting, and another is the neural network. 
uh, we are making the, for one specific row of your data set, you're making the classification. Let's say this set that's malignant, this set that's uh, benign, and this set that's malignant. So by the voting system, we had two votes against one for malignant. So the final prediction is gonna be the malignant. So that's how you do the hard voting. The soft voting uh, is instead of uh, getting here, the prediction, the final prediction, zero or one, you're gonna have the probability for each one of the classes. We have two classes. So you're gonna have a probability for class zero and a probability for class one. As we have just binary, it's just uh, the probability for class one. So let's say that you have a probability of 0 0.98. Uh, here we have the probability of 0 0.94 and here the probability of uh, 0 0.92. No, here the probability as showed, as I said before, it's showed as benign. So the probability was 0 0.4 and here as malignant, the probability was 0 0.7. So you're gonna take the average of those three probabilities. And then the voting is gonna be also after converting the final probability to the class. So here is gonna be something close to 0 0.7 in the end, between 0 0.6 and 0 0.7 by these numbers that I said. So the probability is gonna be one. So it's gonna classify as malignant. Hmm. So it's like a bit like putting Bayes into it or? Pardon? Is it a bit Bayesian or is it just? Yeah, it's a little bit Bayesian, yeah. Okay. And just by changing here from hard to soft, we improved the malignant classes, keeping the benign the same. So I have a question from Paulina, just wondering, would it make sense to make classifiers list like log reg, log reg and a gradient boosting? Yes, it makes sense if you use different hyperparameters. Uh, if you remember for the logistic regression, I selected this class weight balanced. We could use another logistic regression with all this being balanced. So you're gonna have two different logistic regression models. Uh, and then we could add a gradient boosting, like you said, or if you wanted to make this semi-model twice, uh, you don't need to include like that. You could just change the weight here. If you wanna be this model to be included twice, you can change the weight here to be two. Yeah, that's so, what I was wondering. If it's like the same, you can just use one logistic regression, just give the weight to. Yeah. Because if, if we consider that we would like to have like less uh, false positives, we are interested pro probably more in logistic regression. So maybe it should be more, like more included. I don't know if it would make sense. That could be tricky because when you do that, for example, we actually made the, the, the stacking model or the vote model to be now similar to the logistic regression. We gave so much weight to the logistic regression mm -hmm. that we're getting the same metric as the logistic regression. So we are not using too much the probabilities of the gradient boosting in the neural network. So these numbers you have to try very slowly, like 10% more importance to the logistic regression. So you can try this. So we kept as the same before, or those are also trial and error, but uh, just give me the same weight for each one of them. We got a better uh, classification and actually a better classification for the malignant. Okay, understand. Huh? Thanks. Oops, I'm a bit confused by Paulina's question because isn't the idea of having an ensemble that each each one's different or? Yeah, the idea is to have each one different, but you can also have uh, one that you consider more important. She okay. asked if you could include it twice. We can but it's the same as give you a higher weight for that model. So, oh, so it would give you the same answer in those two and it would just... Yeah, it would be the same okay. as included these twice, the logistic regression twice. So what about just do two rather than three? Uh, you mean two models? Yeah. 
Well, you can do two models. You can keep it the same weight. I can remove, for example, the neural network from here. I'm going to remove. So I just have to remove another weight. And that's the model that you got in the end. Actually, improve it. You know, it got <laughs> better for the, this one. So the neural network is damaging this stacking. So also, you have to be careful about your stacking. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so it's now, like having a committee where one of the people on the committee is an idiot. Uh, yes. <laughs> exactly. I think we say uh, he's biased. That's, biased. Uh, yeah. yeah. Better way to call <laughs> idiot. So I have a question from Ninoska. In the first part for the meta regressor, wouldn't it be better to discard an input regressor that might have a low prediction score? Yeah, that's what you just saw in the classification. You can have a regressor that's actually damaging. Why would you want to add to the meta regressor, a model regressor that might not be suitable for the data set? Uh, that's a, a tricky question because the meta regressor uh, is not working with the training data set anymore, the meta regressor. So let me just show the, the documentation for the, the meta regressor. So it should be in here, the stacking regressor. So the meta regressor is gonna be doing a regression on the predictions, not on the features of the training param of the training data set anymore. So we actually don't know if this is linear or not. So it, it's again, some kind of a try and error. Uh, the meta regressor is gonna be, be trained over the predictions of uh, each one of the regressors. So it's a little different, but uh, when you are combining the models in here, uh, in this example, for example, uh, I remove it, the gradient boosting and to see how does it work. So let me just run everything above this one to refresh our models and our data sets. So for example, we know that the linear regression is the one that did the worst. So we can just remove it and run and see how it goes. So it's training and it's running and then you can compare this stack. Now it's got dominated by the gradient boosting. Actually, by not including the linear regression, even though the linear regression is not uh, the best model, it's finding uh, apparently there are some properties that are linear inside there. So what it is is stacking regressor is doing, it's combining the linear properties in the data set with a linear model and the other non-linear models for the non-linear properties. So even though we got a worst score compared to these two models, uh, in some, we don't know uh, which one of the data actually we got the worst. So, so probably some parts are being better predicted by the linear regression and the gradient boosting and the neural network. So Marcelo, go back to your, your cross plot again, that data set at the top. I've been noticing, yeah, that one there. You see that line of points at five. Do you think that's biasing your results? Because it looks like, I, I can't remember, what are, the two, what are the two attributes you're using here? It's because, uh, let me just plot uh for the target but it looks like there's a whole set of points that are all reading the same value for each actually X. those are the true values they are always five right they are always getting five it's because we have a, a cap oh. so when you do here uh a histogram mm. of the the data of the target, the true value, we see that you have a higher number close to five. So we have a cap in here. So 
uh, you see the distribution should be probably going this direction and going longer and decreasing, right? Oh, so they've cut it off. And so I'll, everything greater than four. And it's five. Is five. Okay. So we have a, so that created a bias in the data yeah. set. Yeah. The rich people didn't want to advertise how rich they were. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So do you think would it make sense to ex just uh, remove those as outliers? Like, would, would it possibly can just help maybe with finding these patterns? We could, now that we know that we have this capping, we could remove this cap, now this data here because before we didn't know, right? We don't know what is a, what is higher than five and what is not initially. Hmm. But now that we have these, we could just tag those and just keep a few one here that are close to the line. But you could think, remove um, some of them. I think Marcelo, in one of the ways they were improving the uh, regression in this data set was using irregular beans, if I remember. So they were creating some beans, uh, you know, based on uh, uh, just to improve the distribution of this. So you, you could make them uh, different width and that way the, the last beam was a bit uh, wider. I think that improved the, if I remember an example we, we did in the course. Okay, we can try that later, definitely. So, uh, basically that's it that I have for presenting today. So that's how we do uh, combine it. That's how we combine machine learning models to create a more robust and powerful model in the end. So I just want to finish with a, a slide of thank you. So if you have any questions, now is the time to ask. So you yeah, can unmute. I have one more yes. question because when you showed that original paper, uh, you showed that one of the um, methods that was they were using was uh, support ve support vector regression. And yeah. do you not have that available or, or you decided not to use that one? Uh, I just decided to go for one linear, uh, one gradient boosting and one neural network. But okay. uh, yes, you can do, we can just uh, include. We can just so they work. have support vector regression in- um, In scikit-learn, yeah. In scikit-learn, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Actually, I use the support vector regression as the meta regressor. Okay. Now, I so, assume the real advantage to doing the hybrid forecasting is how each of these methods would deal with random noise differently. And then the hybrid forecaster would actually handle the noise because the three of them would fall into different categories. So one of the advantages over just running one of them is dealing with random noise. Yeah. Your data set. That's one of the explanation. And sometimes also one model work better in a area of your data set and other work better in another part of our data set. Uh, if you visit the, the cruise website, I'm just gonna show. I think now it's open for everybody. Um, we have for our sponsors, we have the research reports. In 2018, I did a work for faces classification. So now that is two years old, it may be available for everybody to download. Uh, which one? This one, this re report here. I actually work in the same way working with different uh, weighting them. So you can download and take a look. I, I have another question. It would be nice if we could get our, if you could get your hands on some kind of renewable versus non-renewable resources report from Alberta, because we're getting heavily into, into both, right? Do you know of anybody like, is the Haskane school doing anything like that or? I mean, if you could get your hands on Alberta data, it would be very worthwhile to, to do those methods, apply these methods. Oh yeah. Uh, I'm actually looking for that to get those data, but uh, probably I'm not gonna be presenting a learning lab this year. So that would be for the research in Cruise. Mm -hmm. And then next year we might be available to present after the sponsors meeting. Okay.
but yeah, I'm looking for data. I wanted to work with more renewable energy, I'm looking into that. So any other question? So if you don't have any other question, I'm gonna stop the recording and uh, thank everybody for coming and thank you for the participation. It was really nice today and see you in two weeks. <laughs>